This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. The story of St. Patrick, a boy who was taken captive by Irish pirates. He came over as a slave, as a young boy. But then he did escape, and the next time he came back, it was with the view then to spread in Christianity. St. Patrick came here on a boat and brought Christianity. He walked all over Ireland. Patrick had total belief in his mission. Patrick was down to earth. He had his two feet on the ground. He wasn't on a pedestal. Simple man, preacher. Patrick had a very successful mission. A growth of Christianity through what happened here, which was the fruits of Patrick's ministry. I'm Paul Wright and welcome to the third programme of Back from the Brink, the series which investigates the role of the early medieval Irish in helping to save Western civilization. In our last programme, we heard how St. Patrick's 5th century mission among the Irish helped to kick-start the golden age of Irish history when Ireland became renowned as the land of saints and scholars. We also heard how during Patrick's 30 years of missionary work in Ireland from the mid-5th century onwards, he experienced much outside interference. Tim Campbell, director of the St. Patrick Centre in Downpatrick, County Down, explains. The only reason we know about Patrick is because he had this argument with his bishops uh, who sent him. Uh, Like every good story, he narrates you through it, but there is a subplot. And it's often difficult to really get to the essence of the subplot. But it goes like this, that when Patrick came here as a bishop, the bishops who sent him, probably from, from Britain, said that you know, they were expecting him to be able to find churches and send money back to the mother church. That was part of his um, his remit. Um, but whenever he got here, he start, certainly started to make churches, but he started to get a bit above himself as far as they were concerned. He started to call himself the Bishop of Ireland when he was really only sent here as a missionary. And he was founding churches, but he didn't seem to be sending any money home. And I think that what happened was that he, he was going from one place to the next, and people were bailing him out, and he was finding churches, and there wasn't a big lot of money to send back. But he does seem to be converting people. So this created a, a bit of a problem. So what they did back at uh, base was they decided they would find out a bit more about this troublesome Patrick who had gone AWOL. So they dug up one of his friends from his youth, who had uh, said that Patrick had confessed to him of some sort of a grave sin whenever he was just a teenager. And we don't know what the sin was, whether you know he had murdered someone or maybe it was something a lot less troublesome than that. But um, Patrick became aware that they knew that uh, this person had confessed about his confession and uh, they eventually decided that uh, they would confront Patrick with it. And Patrick said that his mission was completely pure and that he just feared for the soul of his friend because he confided in him and uh, in, in strictest confidence. He was brought, so to speak, to an ecclesiastical court and had to defend himself. Down Patrick based historian Sean Grogan. He says that his mission was abused and he was accused of different things and so on. One of the things of uh, a sin in his youth, whether it was sexual or whatever it is, but he said he had repented of that. And it is said that that would have been a, something that would have prevented him to become a bishop. But he, he maintained, he said, look, he had done his penance for that. Well, Patrick, he gets very, very sore about uh, somebody who told on him. Uh, who, who who squealed, if you like, who who, who released a secret uh, that he had made to this person about an event that happened when he was, was at 15 years of age. Joseph Duffy, historian and also author of the best-selling book on Patrick called Patrick in his own words. Now, if you think about what serious event could or sin could a young person commit, uh, it it was it either had to do it could have been in the sexual area, it could have been a, a, a theft of some kind, or it could have been some act of treachery, uh, you know, letting down his friends or something, something that was considered very serious at the time. We 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 have to accept that. Was there a hint of envy or jealousy? I can see the old green eyes, perhaps of. 
uh, you know, other ecclesiastical figures uh, over in Britain. Uh, perhaps maybe, was he a bishop in Britain? And was he accused of forsaking his office there because he left there and went over to this place called Hibernia, you, you know, Ireland, where these pagans were? Why should he go there and leave his own place where his ministry should have been in Britain? Uh, and then hearing of a success, how, you know, uh, because there is that jealousy and envy, I suppose, in every one of us, and even in clerical circles as well, you know, uh, this thing of he's succeeding and I'm not. Uh, so I, I could see that jealousy there. He reeled against that, of course, uh, and, and said, you know, if, well, if he's doing something for God and God is important, so what? It's not, he is not the important one. It is God uh, and the mission of God and God's message which has been proclaimed. So why stop it? Historian Sean Grogan. Here is Michael King, historian and also curator of the Down County Museum, to take up the story. He really felt that God himself uh, had given him this mission, possibly not the church, and uh, maybe claiming too much. Um, And it may be that he was set up in some way by you know the the, the church organisation in in Britain to, to to bring him back down to size a bit, and that something had been dug up, uh, as you might find in in political circles, to really bring, bring him down to to size. Um, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the news of the world that did it, but um, something in his past was was blown up into something immense to really to, to bring him to book. Patrick seems to have uh, ended up not going back. Uh, he never seems to have gone back. He's written his letter and he seems to have stayed here in Ireland, uh, I think probably until the end of his days. Historian Tim Campbell. Here is Michael King once again to share his opinion. He survived in his mission and uh, he managed to hang on to his authority in Ireland and possibly it was resented in Ireland um, you know what the British Church tried to do to him, and maybe he was, you know, valued more uh, in Ireland, and perhaps that's why he was adopted rather than a Roman bishop. You know, somebody like Palladius was an outsider. Maybe they adopted Patrick as one of their own, really, because he'd he spoke Irish and he knew how to work with the Irish. There's an interesting connection between Saul and Dan Patrick because. Just before St. Patrick died, possibly in, in, in about 461, he was on his way to Armagh, and uh, he, he was really, really expecting to pass away quite soon. And an angel appeared to him and said, no, you're going to die in Saul. You've got to go back to Saul. And uh, you've got to arrange for uh, a cart and two oxen to be prepared so that your body can be put on the, the cart. And wherever that cart goes you're to be buried. And so that happened, and we know, we, we believe that the, the cart uh, and the, the, drawn by the oxen went down what would be the Saul Road now, uh, up what is now English Street, and, and ended up on the Hill of Down, where, you know, which we can see from here. And that's what, why he was buried there. He was a great charismatic figure who was able to persuade people and put over his own self-belief. And I think people really were, really believed that he was sent by God to bring them the word and bring them into the fold and to save their souls. And he was able to really um, convince them that, you know, on the day of judgment, he would be leading them to heaven. So Patrick, apostle to the Irish people, died in and around the year 461 AD. He'd spent the best part of 30 years working as a missionary among the Irish. So just how successful was his mission? County Down local historian Albert Colmar. It has to be said it was successful. No other words other than successful. After his death... There were missionaries before him. There were missionaries many after him. Uh, We know that the great monastic 
uh, development took place covering the island of Ireland. We know that these great monastic sites, the, the local one would be Nendrum, Bangor, and many in uh, the southern part of the island, for example, Clan Macnoise. These uh, schools not only saved the Christian faith, it developed education, it developed uh, intelligence in a way that hadn't been developed before. We do know that from uh, these great monastic sites, scholars were then to take the Christian message across into, for example, Iona is a classical one, down through mainland Britain into Europe and eventually even coming back into northern Italy. So one can only say in human terms, Patrick's mission has to be described as being successful. I think the secret of success was something called humility. Because uh, humility is nothing other than, from the Latin word humus meaning the earth. Patrick was down to earth. He had his two feet on the ground. Historian Sean Grogan. He wasn't on a pedestal. He wasn't on a height. Humility means a recognition of the truth. The truth of who I am, what I am, and nothing in the sight of God, but I can be everything in him who strengtheneth me. Times were impossible. So Patrick's simple message was their belief in God, their equality and equality, men, women and children. That, I think, if I had been one of his listeners, would have appealed to me. It must have been that they permitted him to carry this, meeting the high kings of Ireland, meeting the high uh, uh, chieftains, meeting the sub-chieftains, meeting the ordinary man, woman in the street. He must have been able to communicate. I think the whole word for Patrick, he learned the language as a prisoner. He was able to communicate. That's what appeals to me. So what is Patrick's ultimate legacy? Early medieval historian Kay Tristram of Holy Island, Lindisfarne. Patrick's legacy might well have been, although we these these Britain these other Britons are nameless and so on, but it might well have been that he actually paved the way. He was the icebreaker, he paved the way. After him, other people thought, Well, maybe God is calling us. Maybe we should make sure that our neighbours just across the water there don't remain within their pagan darkness. <laughs> So it could have been that he really did, that knowledge of what he had done. Uh, and you see, if it is true that he belonged to the Church of Carlisle, uh, certainly he belonged to a, an important church somewhere down the West Coast. But if it was, for example, Carlisle, I mean, they would make sure that the knowledge of what he was achieving was, uh, was broadcast. They would make sure of that to fellow Christians, because they would have been... They were, they were a bit doubtful about him uh, in places, but at least he was theirs, you know. They would have wanted to know what he was doing and support him in it, and they would have made sure to tell the rest of the world what Patrick was up to. Patrick certainly was endowed with a with an extremely fine-tuned missionary spirit and zeal. Historian Joseph Duffy I mean, the mission was everything for Patrick. Outreach, and that perpetuated itself, not just in the centuries immediately following Patrick, but right down through history. And and certainly in the in the in the in the late nineteenth century, you know, when 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 the Irish uh, church follow the Irish diaspora into the Anglophone world. You know, uh, uh, all the the, the con on, on a continental basis. You know, you're thinking of North America, Australia, South Africa, India, places like that. Where the British Empire went, the Irish missionaries followed it, and 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 that's that's the spirit of Patrick, really. And that's 
you know, in a way, the, the, that's that's the legacy of Patrick, really, and that there are so many hundreds of churches called after Patrick throughout the world. I mean, that's that's the living proof of of what we're talking about. And historian Tim Campbell once again gives his opinion. Patrick started a, a whole tradition here of um, celebrating uh, Christianity, uh, and and he put in practice the way in which it would eventually be uh, be done. And of course, whenever dark ages came to to the rest of Europe, it, the light of Christianity came from Ireland to those places, reigniting uh, Christianity into uh, Dark Age Europe. So that's one of the really major legacies of Patrick. And all the things that come with it, all of the Arda chalice and everything else, uh, those all have a direct relationship back to this one man. Patrick had total belief in his mission. He saw Ireland as on the edge of the world and that his mission really before the Day of Judgment was to bring within... Uh, the Christian world, the island of Ireland on the edge. And what he did was incredible. He managed to really get a foothold for Christianity in Ireland as nobody else has succeeded in doing. Patrick's act of bringing literacy to Ireland um, really, I suppose, provided a powerhouse of intellectual activity, um, manuscript copying, and uh, really, I suppose, the dissemination of knowledge back to Europe from where it had come. Historian Michael King. Here's Albert Colmer to once again share his views. Patrick's legacy is that he brought Ireland, a land of mists, into the modern world at that time. A place that was developed and sending out missionaries, men and women, to the known world developing faith in the Christian faith. So his, his beliefs are still here today. All he stood and preached for and died for. And Ireland's place will never be lost. No matter what it's famous for, Patrick is famous as long as Stephen Kine survives. The Annals of History record that St. Patrick helped to kickstart the golden age of Irish history, when Ireland became globally renowned as the land of saints and scholars. And to hear how Irish monks such as Columba built on Patrick's phenomenal success by leaving Ireland to go out and convert Scotland, then make sure to catch our next number four programme in this 12-part Back from the Brink series. This programme was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, songs by Cliff Wedgbury. Until our next programme, I'm going to leave the last word with various contributors, including County Down local historian Albert Colmar divulging one fascinating story. We all heard of the men on the moon. Uh, there's a, a gentleman called Jim Irvin, Colonel Jim Irvin, who actually drove the moon buggy on the expedition to the moon in 1971. Uh, Jim uh, came over to Ireland uh, and uh, he shared a platform with me and I took him on the the tour that I drew. And he was so impressed, he's very proud of his Irish connections, uh, that he came back a second time. But Jim Irwin, uh, when he arrived on the moon, he believed there was something. He admits himself that he, he wasn't a strong believer. And that when he got to the moon, 
and got out of the the spacecraft and uh, then got into his gear and uh, drove the moon buggy and looked back at Earth in all this beautiful co- The blackness of the sky, there's no star reflection. Sheer where he was on the moon and looking at Earth. Then he, then he believed that there was a force, no matter what word you want to use, greater than mankind. And uh, what he told me, I, I cherish, because Jim, Jim coming back developed heart problems. That was to eventually um, kill him uh, in 1991. And uh, when he left uh, the Earth for the moon, his mother, who I met, uh, gave him two little capsules and then encapsulated with a shamrock in each of them. And uh, he, sh- he showed me the one that was his mother's. And he, and, uh, he says, what? I said, what are you doing, Jim, with the other one? He says, when we came back, obviously all our rubbish and, this, and the buggy and all is still on the surface of the moon. And where we landed, and uh, you've seen the photograph, Paul, of him uh, in his gear, the capsule is still sitting on the surface of the moon. The other one is back in his family's possession. And I treasure that. When I think of, we've just come out from the North point of view, horrendous troubles. And we pray that we are reaching real peace in this island. That should anything ever happen, even in world terms or in Irish terms, then there will always be peace of Patrick on the moon as long as the universe exists, that we find the shamrock, traditionally used by Patrick in teaching the Trinity, and that shamrock, left by Jim on the moon, is there for prosperity. St. Patrick. St. Patrick, he was brought over here as a slave, he escaped, he went back to France or whatever, then he came back here as a bishop to teach the gospel and all the rest of it. Patrick came here to bring the Christianity. He really had a very special place in the history of Christianity. He came in 432. Himself was just a simple Christian evangelist. Patrick, he must have been totally committed. It really got people believing. St. Patrick made an enormous impact on the Irish. Kind Patrick was his name As Caesar's empire fell apart The Irish pirates came To take the lad in 401 To county down a slave A shepherd in the Slimish hills A holy road to pay Constant cold and hunger was the Slimish mountain's gift. But then a vision came to him and his heart began to lift. An angel seemed to bid him go and sail across the sea to share his love of God and man with his own dear family but then the visions didn't stop they bid him to return to speak the word of God's sweet love and the lessons to be learned awake the hearts of every man with gospels to embrace and ban the sin of slavery within the Irish race to change the hearts of evil men and piracy be banned for God's true law must be obeyed 
and those who won't be damned. Let winds of change, change blow hard and all the slaves go free. Break the chains of pirate ships to flounder in God's sea. Selfless love was Patrick's song to all the Irish race. A quiet revolution came, transforming every place. And the nation's heart was one of love, with prayer a holy sage. To make an island fit for saints, to read the holy page. Feel the wind of changes come, embrace what's good for you. And always do to others as they would do to you. Yes, feel the wind of changes come, with Patrick's message true. And always do to others as you'd have them do to you. And always do to others as you'd have them do to you. today with the Trinity around me I arise today with the Lord to be my guide Creator of creation He will be my flame I arise today in worship in His name I arise today with the love of all the angels. I arise today with the prayers of righteous men. The strength of heaven shines in the radiance of the sun. The whiteness of the moon or the new day just begun. With the splendor of the fire, the deepness of the sea, I arise today to be upheld by thee. 